Hey everyone, welcome to this joint session hosted by NXP and Qt, where we'll be looking at how to optimize next generation smart home designs using high performance i.mx RT crossover MCUs and Qt for MCUs. My name is Patrick Kennedy. I'm an engineer at NXP where I focus on working with customers to define, develop, and optimize IoT solutions utilizing NXP's edge processing portfolio that includes microcontrollers and microprocessors. Here with me today is Pat Shelley, Solutions Engineering Manager at Qt. Now, before getting started, you might be wondering, what exactly do we mean by optimization? What do we mean by next generation? And why do we need optimization for in the smart home? To illustrate why optimization is important and what we mean by this in the context of developing smart home products, we can look at a very simple use case. Thermostats. So when I was growing up, my thermostat looked something like this, consisting of a couple dials and switches. And yet over time, we all know and can see that functionality for these thermostats has risen rapidly. What used to be a purely analog interface comprising basic buttons now comprises high resolution, full color touchscreen LCD displays with voice control, personalization options, and invisible UIs like geofencing that detect when you leave your home. Overall, we can easily see the same progression across many common household items, ranging from large appliances like ovens and washers to smaller appliances like coffee machines, blenders, to even personal devices like weight scales. Broadly speaking, we can summarize these developments across all of these applications into three key trends forging the future. Firstly, the inclusion of graphical user interfaces in a wide range of embedded products, leading to advanced software demands, driving the need for higher performance and power efficiency. Secondly, heightened expectations and demand for a rich UI experience with relatively advanced functionality and a focus on intuitive interfaces. And thirdly, a desire on the business end to streamline design and development to deliver products faster by taking a platform approach where one can maximize scalability and reusable software. Now with all of these trends comes the somewhat obvious conclusion that all of these features inevitably require more power and memory. So how do we balance these new requirements with existing business requirements? How do we streamline the development process to save time and money and ultimately get our product to market quicker? While NXP provides a broad range of edge processing solutions in both general purpose MCUs like Kinetis and LPC families and applications processors like the i.mx and Layerscape series, the i.mx RT crossover series of MCUs combines the real-time control and power efficiency characteristics of MCUs with the performance and multimedia integration of MPUs. First announced in 2017, the i.mx RT crossover MCU series now includes devices with performance ranging from over 200 megahertz, Cortex M33, all the way up to 1 gigahertz on Cortex M7 an internal SRAM ranging from 256 kilobytes up to five megabytes. Select devices also include additional processors and accelerators like integrated GPUs, DSPs, parallel MIPI display interfaces, and audio subsystems. The i.mx RT 1170 and i.mx RT 1160, along with the i.mx RT 500, encapsulate some of the latest and greatest in terms of graphics and multimedia function. Before diving into the iDotMX RT 1170, it's worth noting that the iDotMX RT crossover MCU series targets lower bomb costs via the large internal SRAM, as well as low cost package options and integrated PMIC with DC DC conversion for simplified hardware design. The series also utilizes off chip memories to provide a lower cost of programming, which provides an additional benefit of memory scalability and similarly frees up die space for other peripherals although it should be noted that there are options for embedded flash on select devices. Looking closer at the iDynamics RT1170 crossover MCU family, the key things to note for this device include the dual core and on-chip RAM, with the Cortex M7 running up to 1 GHz, and an additional power-efficient Cortex M4 running up to 400 MHz, an additional multimedia subsystem for graphics, display, and camera interfaces, including L parallel and MIPI LCD interface displays, for, as well as MIPI CSI, and finally, a 2D GPU with graf vector graphic support and an additional pixel processing pipeline, which we'll cover in more detail shortly. The device also includes two 1 gigabit Ethernet with AVB and TSN support, as well as an audio subsystem, as mentioned before, including a PDM microphone interface with hardware voice activity detection for voice applications and wake word detection. And finally, an analog subsystem, including two low power high-performance ADCs, as well as a 12-bit DAC.
Overall, the Atom X RT 1170 crossover MCU provides performance and low power in a dual core MCU within a single package. This provides the additional advantage of booting from the Cortex M7, where the Cortex M7 boots first and controls the entire system, and the Cortex M4 can be enabled on need for things like sensor fusion, voice detection, or even customized communication protocols. Or alternatively, the Cortex M4 can boot first and control the entire system and function as a security subsystem or basic system housekeeping. And the Cortex M7 can be enabled on need for things like UI maintenance and computational needs. In terms of low power, the Cortex M4 core is optimized specifically for lower power and can stay alive when DCTC is off. And additionally, the Cortex M4 contains a fully isolated environment and additional resource domain control isolation between the two cores, providing a means of authenticating and partitioning resources between the two cores. Taking a closer look at the graphics subsystem, the IMX RT1170 contains multiple camera and display interfaces, a PXP graphics accelerator, and a 2D GPU supporting OpenVG and vector graphics operations. As mentioned previously, the device supports both MIPI and parallel camera and display interfaces. Starting with the camera interface or CSI block, this supports both parallel CSI and MIPI CSI. Through the video MUX, either imaging signal can be routed to the CSI block for processing. In addition to forming image data, the CSI block can also provide the histogram and quantization functionality. The PXP supports color space conversion, rotation, and alpha blending, while the 2D GPU enables vector graphics on device, improving image quality and in many cases reducing image file size. The heterogeneous graphics engine works directly on video and display buffers in memory, freeing up CPU cycles for other tasks. You'll also notice there are two display controllers on the device, each of which can be muxed to either of the display interfaces, meaning two displays can be driven simultaneously. And the device supports resolutions up to WXGA at 60 frames per second, which comes out to roughly 1280 by 800 resolution. One of the newer IP blocks on the device is the LCD interface version 2 display controller. Graphics are read directly from memory and blended in real time, which allows for dynamic content creation with minimal CPU intervention. This controller also has a pass-through mode where the video buffer can be accessed directly and blended with UI widgets on the fly. This video buffer can come from the CSI block or video content stored in memory. This block supports eight layers of alpha blending with one foreground layer for video, a static background image layer, and six UI layers for overlay graphics, and really essentially provides a means of blending video and graphical UIs with minimal overhead. For the MIPI interfaces, the MIPI DSI interface implements all three DSI layers from pixel to pipe backing, low level protocol, and lane management, and essentially consists of one clock lane and two data lanes, with a high speed mode running up to 1.5 gigabits per second, and a 10 megabits per second data rate in low power mode. Compared to parallel interfaces, MIPI DSI and CSI interfaces are lower power and take up less board space due to the serial connectivity. The RT1170 also includes vector graphic support through the 2D GPU. This 2D GPU uses geometrical primitives such as points, lines, curves, and polygons, and based on mathematical equations to represent images in computer graphics. This is different from raster graphics, which is really more so a representation of images as a collection of pixels, whereas vector-represented images are more flexible than bitmaps. So we can have lossless resizing and stretching, and also it looks better on devices with higher resolution, and we also can have representation of images often requiring less memory. And most importantly, there is no need to redesign your UI if your resolution changes. For example, you can keep all the same branded assets and images and icons that you would use on, say, a smartphone companion app as is used on your smart home device display. The 2D GPU core consists of Avanti GC355 OpenGV core running up to 528 MHz and includes additional support for OpenVG, as well as your typical vector graphics fun functions such as rasterization, transformation, color conversion, path and stroke generation, paint rules, transparency, and Porter Duff blending. The device also includes a 2D graphics pixel pipeline engine, which essentially is a high efficiency graphics 2D and image processing engine capable of performing common image processing functions such as bit blit, image composition, color space conversion, single pass processing for overlays and rotations and resizing, 
And finally, a data pipeline mode using conjunction with the LCD interface for bandwidth savings on your memory. Okay, so in terms of hardware and software enablement, the IMX RT1170 EVK includes a number of memory chips to test performance, a MIPI LCD display connector, as well as a MIPI camera sensor, an audio codec along with audio headphone jacks, external speaker connections, microphone, both analog and digital, as well as an SPDIF connector, a number of connectivity interfaces, and general tools and OS support with the MCU Expresso software and tools, including the MCU Expresso SDK with Amazon Free RTOS, as well as support for IAR and Keel IDEs. The MCU Expresso ESCA ecosystem is supported on all of these EVKs for these devices and many of the other MCUs. It includes core technologies from NXP, such as the MCU Expresso IDE, the MCU Expresso SDK, which includes a number of device drivers, board support packages, device family packages, as well as pieces of key pieces of middleware, such as USB stacks, graphics middleware, and much more. Included here are some links to get you started. Please feel free to visit us at our booth. We can discuss more, and there's a whole bunch of other useful links there. And with that, I'll hand it over to Pat, who's going to be covering Qt on MCUs for this family of devices. Thank you, Patrick. That was great information. Hi, my name is Pat Shelley with the QT Company. And in this next segment, I'm going to take a look at how the QT tools and framework can be used to create a tiered product offering, while at the same time reusing assets and using a common tool chain and process across the range of, of product offering. So having a, a low, a mid, a high, and being able to reuse uh, assets and, and common development and design process uh, throughout. Now, the traditional QT offering includes some, you know, four major components. One is um, programming language support, and that's support for typically C++ or JavaScript, and that's to implement um, kind of the back-end logic in your UI application. Uh, secondly is the framework, and that's um, libraries and, and other components that support uh, building and executing your application on a variety of, of platforms. And those platforms include desktop, mobile devices, and embedded systems. And then of course, there's the, the developer and designer tools. So tools for developer uh, developers, that's primarily Qt Creator and the tools associated with that, uh, that allows you to build, build your application for a selected platform um, run the application, profile the application on those platforms. So that's the, the embedded end of development. And then up front of that typically is the tools for the designer. Um, that's primarily built around Qt Design Studio and the, um, the bridges that allow you to bring in assets from uh, tools like Figma or Photoshop or Sketch or, or the 3D tools that are commonly used. So being able to import that those design elements from their native design tools, um, bring them into, into Qt and, and QML format uh, so that they can easily be built for any, any system. And at that point, um, the QML code that you're working with is really, uh, it is the production system code. It's the production code that's going into your system. So the designers and developers are able to collaborate on a single unified code base uh, that it gets built in and, and run as the final product. Now, what is QT for MCUs? Um, it really is that, that whole framework, the, um, the framework the, um, the tooling, so Qt Creator, Qt Design Studio, the framework, the programming language support, it's all those things we talked about. Um, but it, it really the highlight for Qt for MCU is um, we're providing a custom and highly optimized graphic, graphics engine for use on these lower end MCU devices. And we've also done a modification to the build tool chain. So, so builds are not, um, you know, kind of purely QML uh, based anymore, but rather in the build process, your QML is converted to C++ code. 
uh, for the purpose of building for these, these lower end systems. And as a result of that, through the optimization and kind of this change to our, our build process, we're able to come up with highly optimized binaries to run on these devices. Now, when we talk about creating a tiered or scalable product line, um, it's desirable to develop that product line with a common uh, workflow, uh, designer developer workflow, and, and base it on a common technology. And that's what Cube for MCU allows you to do. So you can imagine a low end system that might be based on uh, something like an, an NXP. Uh, IDENM XRT 1050 device, targeting the low end, a small display, um, simple fun functionality, but primarily hitting a, a low low cost point. Um, a step up from that, you might have something in a mid range. It may have better graphics. It may have even uh, 3D graphics, depending on how you segment your line. Uh, but it'll have a richer UI on a larger screen. And then there could be like a high-end version of the platform as well. And that could have internet connectivity. It could have um, video playback. It uh, could have very rich 3D content. And then taking it a step further, you could even have uh, a companion app that could run on an Android or Apple phone that interacts with the system that gives you advanced capability or, or remote access to your devices in, um, in the home. And with Qt, and, um, and, and partly, especially at the low end, enabled with the Qt for MCU line, uh, we allow you to use a common set of assets. So those, those QML files that ultimately define your UI and are created with the Qt Design Studio tool. Um, those assets, those reusable components can be reused across the different levels of your, your product uh, offering. And, and, and the higher end will have additional functionality, uh, but certainly across all four uh, areas, across all, all four applications, the low, the mid, the high, and the companion app, uh, you can absolutely reuse uh, a lot of your content a lot of the graphics, all the framework, use a common tooling environment to create these UIs and really enable the reuse of, of software components, of UI components across the platform levels. What we've been watching here on the screen is the low-end system. So that was created in, in Qt Design Studio. It's designed for a small screen. It's got a very simple user interface. So start button, there's modes to select what you're cooking. Um, those assets, though, that are used in the in the low end system, um, can be reincorporated into what we're seeing now. This is the the high end version of this, so this could be targeting an IMX6 or an IMX8 device with a larger screen. There's definitely a lot more a lot more functionality incorporated into the application, and as with the low end system. Uh, while it does target a specific piece of hardware, we're also able to use the um, the desktop kit in either Qt for MCU or normal Qt uh, to preview the UI on the um, on the desktop and see what it's going to look like. So, um, what we're seeing here is the, is the high end system. This also incorporates some video, so you can have streaming video, streaming recipes. Um, a lot of capability here, advanced 3D that's not capable in the lower end devices. Now, because of the cross-platform nature of Qt, and that is um, kind of you, you write the code once and you can build it anywhere, provided that the functionality is available on the target, we're able to preview these applications on the desktop. Um, taking that a step further is the companion app. So. Um, not only can we build for the desktop, we can easily build for an Android or an Apple a mobile device, a phone or a tablet. And what we're seeing here is actually uh, reuse of some of the assets that were created directly for the product, so the built-in UI in the, um, in the product, um, reusing those assets into a, a companion app that would be available from a mobile device and allow you to connect to uh, the unit, um, control the unit, um, configure, con con uh, program the unit um, remotely from a phone. 
Um, so this is another, you know, outstanding capability we offer in that not only can we use this QML code and these design assets on low-end systems targeting, um, you know, MCU devices, um, we can use them all the way up to desktop and mobile devices as well. So here we see the um, one of the versions of the product. So your tiered product, um, this is the high-end tier. This is shown in Design Studio. So QT Design Studio is where you'd compose these designs originally. And this is where the, the QML code would get generated that would be used either in um, Qt for MCU or traditional Qt. And finally, I'd like to thank you all for joining. Uh, it's been a pleasure having this discussion and I uh, want to let you know about some additional resources we have available. Uh, there is a white paper that we have published that's available from our website on UI trends that covers a lot of the topics we saw here in the session today. Um, there's some free demos you can download um, that are pre-built demos for NXP devices. Technical training on Qt for MCUs. So we're offering a, a one-day training, and with the promo code you get as a result of attending the session today, um, you can take that training for free. And lastly, there's additional NXP and Qt resources on the on the Qt site. So so again, thank you all for attending. Hope you enjoy the rest of the World Summit, and it's been a pleasure having you here today. Thank you.